All right, we're here with uh, the Swasu head coach, Josh Collins, and we appreciate you being here and um, giving us some insights and helping us out a little bit today. So can you tell us a little bit about how you became the coach there at Swasu? Yeah, thanks for having me, Derek. Um, yeah, I came to Swasu in 2004. At that time, we didn't even have volleyball. Uh, I came here for basketball. I had uh, played basketball in junior college, very loose terminology there. I think I was more of a, a practice person to beat up, but uh, did have a, a short uh, basketball career in college. And then after that, I decided to come to Swasu to be a student assistant for men's basketball. And then my end goal was to work my way up and either coach at the college game or get back to Texas. I, I came from Texas, so get back to Texas and be a high school coach. Um, along the way, though, I, I met uh, Coach Bo Palisodi. He was a coach at my junior college. Um, when I was a sophomore at junior college, I did some line judging for him. That was really my first exposure to the game of volleyball. And I really only knew uh, this and that uh, in, in and out. That was it. This was this was way right. beyond my, you know, I, I couldn't even think about, you know, calling the antenna. You know, I was that'd be way too much for me. So I did some line judging that last year in junior college. And then when I got to Swasu, they were looking to start the program. We didn't have volleyball at the time. And I just went into our athletic director and said, you know, these guys at Clarendon are great guys. They started the program there. They're probably somebody that you should look at. And, you know, a couple of weeks later they were hired. And uh, then Coach Bo asked if I wanted to be his student assistant. And I really, again, I didn't know much about volleyball, but I thought, why not? And so my senior year of college, I was a student assistant for volleyball up until basketball started. And then I was with basketball. Had a, had a full-time assistant job with basketball here uh, for a year and then decided that volleyball was probably my better route and went back to the volleyball program and was with them as a volunteer assistant from 2007 until 2011. In the, in the fall of 2011, Coach Bo announced it would be his last season. Um, and so then I took over as the head coach in the spring of 2012. And that's kind of how I got to got to volleyball. And, you know, I, I remember some of those first games. I couldn't figure out why Coach Bo kept pulling our best player out of the game. And it kind of frustrated me. You know, she would get three or four kills and then he would just randomly take her out of the game. And I couldn't figure out why. Well, it was because she was rotating back row and she was a middle. And I didn't understand rotation. I didn't understand libero. I didn't understand all of that. So uh, now I understand most of it, you know, but uh, still I'm still learning every day and, and growing my, uh, you know, my, my game as well. So that's how I got involved with volleyball. Well, I like that last little bit that you said. That's kind of how you're growing your game. And we've talked about, you know, there's a lot of people that kind of put you guys on a pedestal of you guys know all and, and, and you're just this – so far advanced coach than us. Um, how do you as a college coach continue to grow that knowledge and make yourself better? Well, I think that I have an understanding that, you know, now it's getting to the point where uh, I started with volleyball in 05. So most of these kids that we're recruiting now, they were, you know, three or four when, when I started with volleyball. So I have been involved in the game longer than them. But for most of my career, the players that I was coaching had a better understanding of volleyball than I had. They had been around the game longer. They had, you know, played it at a much higher level than I had ever played it. And so they they understood volleyball better than I did. And I, I think I just kind of had to be okay with that. And um, I, I think that, you know, part of me being okay with that was with, with Coach Bo and just how he mentored me and, and gave me confidence and the fact that you don't have to know X's and O's. You don't have to, you know, know the exact time to, to run the perfect serve receive play. Um, it's more about building culture. And to me, you know, that's that's what separates, uh, you know, good, talented teams from great teams that don't always have to be talented. If you have a really good culture, um, you can beat some teams that are more talented than you. And that's kind of the, you know, building block that we built our program on. And we've always tried to have a really strong culture that can survive um, really tough, you know, talented athletes on the other side of the net. Um, and you know, along the way, we've gotten better at recruiting and we have more to offer here at Swasu than we had at the beginning. And so that's, you know, hopefully pretty soon we'll be able to couple talent and culture and, and be able to really make some noise. So 
but yeah, yeah. we we definitely don't or I don't have it all figured out. Um, you know, and I I am very well aware of that. And like I said, I'm I'm okay with that. I, it makes me want to grow my game and um, you know, joining conversations with you, uh, joining conversations with other people around Oklahoma talking about volleyball, going to club practices and seeing how they're doing things, and uh, you know, going to the ABCA when I get a chance and checking out those. Uh, just any chance I get, you know, I've been to a couple of gold medal squared camps and learned some stuff there. Uh, and I just like to pull uh, different things that work for our program from all kinds of different places. Yeah, you touched on a lot of good points there. Um, you know, I, I know you personally, and I know you are a huge person of the relationship and that culture. And, you know, I think that's what I've gained the most out of talking from you is just understanding that, you know, it, it's not the X's and O's. It's not the hitting the passing. It's, it's sometimes just getting the most out of that kid. You can get 100% out of the kid and she's 100% bought in. You can do a lot of things. I mean, you know, so how important do you think relationship and culture is to building a program? Someone just comes in, you know, let's let's say this is our first year head coach. How important is that to really hammer that home? You know, I, I think that one of the great things that Coach Bo taught me was that I had to coach to my strengths. And that is one of my strengths. You know, there are coaches out there who their players absolutely hate them, but they still win because they push them so hard. They, you know, demand the absolute last drop. Um, their, you know, their standards are set very high and they don't want anything to come between uh, that player and that player getting to the epitome of their game where kind of my personality lends away from that. You know, I, I'm first and foremost concerned with, you know, my players leaving my program with more confidence than they had when they came in, whether they play every set or no sets. I want them to leave with more confidence than they had when they came in. Um, I want them to develop a true, deep friendship and love for their teammates and coaches. And that's, you know, uh, not only – at times when they're hearing, uh, hearing encouragement and good news from their teammates and coaches, but also when, you know, some hard stuff is being said, you know, like you probably should have got that ball or you're better than a C student. You need to get it done in the classroom. And so we've always just tried to build that relationship. And uh, the first thing you have to do is you have to care about the kid more than you care about your personal success. And I think that that's, you know, hard to do sometimes and it's easy to get lost in the wins and losses and you know what your career record is as a coach and all that stuff um but i heard one of the greatest coaches one, one of my biggest mentors in d2 volleyball chris heron from uh washburn university i heard him talk one time and he said he's been to i think 20 23 24 ncaa championships uh ncaa tournaments uh got beaten the final four uh, back in 18 i think highly highly successful and he he rides his kids hard i mean he is a very tough coach and very demanding um but he said you know somebody asked him uh how do you gauge success you've had all this success you've got all these trophies in the trophy case you your winning pre winning percentage as a coach is outrageous how do you gauge success now and he said i gauge success by the number of wedding invitations that i receive every summer and to yep. me, I mean, that just gave me goosebumps because that's what we want to do. We want our kids to leave our program loving our university, loving volleyball still, um, again, with more confidence than they have when they came in. They're ready to attack the real world uh, because at the end of the day, volleyball is just a game. And, you know, it might be my job, but it's probably not going to be any of their jobs unless they go into coaching. And so I hope that they take something positive from it and don't only gain negatives. Yeah, that's good. I I 100% agree, and, and I love the wedding invitation thing. I usually tell my kids that, you know, for me, what, what success looks like is are you becoming a um, productive member of society? Are you treating your husband right, your kids right? Are you, are you becoming the person that you need to become? And, you know, being able to still be part of their life down the road, you know, it, that shows how much of an impact we've done. You know, so I love that wedding, wedding invitation thing. <clears throat> um, so let's kind of shift into 
um, talking about some X's and O's type thing. Um, it, we all, especially at the high school level, and I, I know at the, the college level too, is you know, we're looking for some quality assistance that can really help us and kind of um, help shoulder the load that we we carry as head coaches of the whole program. And so what are a couple of things that maybe you look for if you were, you were out there just picking from a pool of assistance? Well, you know, kind of the first thing that I would look for is something to counter uh, what I do well. Yep. Um, and so I, I am, again, more of the relational um, when it comes to X's and O's on the court. I typically uh, tend to stick with the defensive side of things. I really enjoy defense. Um, you know, and so a lot of times I'll look for somebody who knows a lot about offense, uh, somebody who can – you know, really get with our setters maybe. And we've been extremely lucky. You know, we had uh, Christina Darris, who played here at Swasu, played for me, um, had a really good career here. Uh, one of the most technical hitters that I've ever coached. Uh, so she did a great job with our kids. Uh, we had Kaylee Mater here, uh, another really technical kid. Um, she's now the head coach at Missouri Southern up in the MIAA. Uh, we had Allison Brown. Allison Brown had played uh, at a Division One out in out on the East Coast, Presbyterian. Uh, she was a right side, so she was able to really work with our kids. And we had Caitlin Ogletree, who played at Cincinnati, played at the University of Houston. Um, really, really good setter. Um, then we had <clears throat> um, we had Brenna. Uh, and she played at K State. Uh, was All Big Twelve. Um, really, really good right side hitter for K-State. Uh, so she was able to work with our hitters and uh, all of those kids did a tremendous job. And now, you know, I have Caitlin Dillon, who was um, our defensive player of the year in our conference for two years in a row, a libero. And so this is the first time that I've had a kid who really likes what I like. And so, you, you know, it's it's been really good for me because I've just kind of turned her loose with the defense and let her take uh, charge there. And it's really forced me to to relearn our offense and get more involved with that. And it's been really good. So, uh, you know, I used to always look for somebody who counteracted what I would do. So somebody who is very analytical. I'm not very analytical. Um, somebody who's deep in the X's and O's who dreams about it. But now that I have uh, Kate Dillon, you know, um, I mean, she is just intuitive. She she knows what I'll, I'm looking for because she played for me for four years. She knows people on campus, so all of the, you know, ins and outs that don't necessarily do have to do with what we're doing on the court, she can get those done. Um, but I, I think the number one quality that I I have learned that I need to look for is somebody who can make it here in Weatherford. Um, somebody who can. It's tough when you're out of college and you're not married in Weatherford. It's just kind of a smaller place, okay. and. Uh, all of your friends are still, you know, on the team probably. And so they have to be able to separate themselves from, you know, um, you know, what college students do. Uh, and also have to separate yourself from drama or from, you know, playing time drama or any of that stuff. Uh, but then also have to be very loyal. And, you know, we've had circumstances where my assistants thought somebody should be playing that I didn't think should be. And that's fine. We will argue and we will talk it all out in the, in the war room. But when it, it's time for us to go out to the court. That person needs to be, you know, backing up what I have to say, uh, because that'll tear down a really strong culture really quickly if uh, the differing opinions get out to the team. And so I've been really lucky with that. I've never had a coach who would do that. Uh, they've always been on board with me. Even if they disagree with my decision, they would get behind it. Uh, but I think that that's very important. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, so you have been pretty fortunate people that know knows and you know that could play back in the day um what would you say to a coach that maybe gets the baseball coach or the um, you know a basketball coach that don't know anything about volleyball what how can we utilize them i would you know a lot of times when i transition a player into a coach from our own program i tell them you don't talk unless you're given encouragement I don't want you correcting anything. I don't want you getting on to anybody. If they ask you a question, if they ask you to watch, you know, their approach or, you know, what did I do here on this dig or, you know, something like that, great. Then you can answer them. But at first, you were just developing a relationship. 
And I know that, you know, with our kids who are transitioning, okay, you've been with them for four years playing with them, but now it's different. Your relationship is different. So uh, I would tell the baseball coach, uh, you know, the track coach, whatever it may be, the same thing. If you're not a volleyball X's and O's person, don't say anything unless you're encouraging. Go out there and encourage and, um, you know, pump them up, give them confidence. Uh, you know, obviously, I, I don't want you to encourage them if I'm trying to correct something. You know, don't <laughs> encourage them to keep doing the wrong thing, but maybe right. encourage them in a way of, hey, he's, you know, Coach Jackson's got your interest at heart here. You need to listen to him. You're going to get it. Keep going, you know, and that's what I – that's how I would utilize. And then I would utilize them in ways that, you know, don't involve X's and O's or volleyball, that anybody can put out a cone or – you know, get the net set up or, you know, um, put people into groups or whatever it may be. And so I would utilize them in that way, I think. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I, I just know there's so many people that have those type of assistants and they, we love them. I've had them. And sometimes um, there's some of the best assistants, depending yeah. on what they bring to the table. Um, I had a an assistant while I was out in Clinton and you know, he he didn't know X's and O's in the slightest, but sorry, just a second. <laughs> there it is. Automatic lights. <laughs> you know, he didn't know X's and O's at all, but what he did know was how an athlete should carry themselves and, and how to respond to me, you know, getting on to them, like you said, and correcting them and you know, he was good at understanding situations like, oh, that was a big point. You know, I understand right. that's only one kill, but it was at a time. You know what I mean? He yeah. understood those things. And so he really, he was, he was he was a great person for me to have as an assistant. You know, it's not always the X's and O's. And we just, we've got to do a better job of using our assistants to help the program. And I, I love the idea of if you do get to pick, pick someone that's not like you. Pick yeah. someone who brings up your weaknesses. Their strengths are what will help match and, and you know, really carry the team. So uh, I love that. Um, so if, if you're using stats and you're recommending just like one or two things for a high school team to maybe start dabbling in and be like, you know what, I want to start looking at, is this person a better passer or, or – how well is my setter really doing? I mean, just what are a set or a, a stat or two that you would recommend a high school team to use? Well, at the high school level and at the college level, a lot of times who wins a game, it comes down to serve and pass, right? Um, yep. So those are the things that um, I would be statting immediately at the high school level. We're pretty lucky where we have, you know, a sports information director who gets paid and he's a full-time employee who stats our matches. So we get very detailed stats during the match. So every time out or at least in between sets, we can look and see, okay, our hitters are hitting at this percentage. Um, this is what our blockers are doing. This is what our setters are doing. You know, all of that we can see for both sides. Um, so we might be able to see, okay, this is what their outside hitter is doing to us. She's, she's killing us. Where's she getting us at? Um, but those are all kind of luxuries. I, I know that at the high school level, you don't always have that opportunity. And uh, I know a lot of people utilize their bench to, you know, take um, stats with some kind of iPad program or something. I think that I would try to keep it as basic as possible. And I would just want them to give me a passer rating in serve receive and a server rating from our servers. Um, that way we can talk about, um, you know, we're, we're not getting it done. We need to be we set a team goal of two point four. Um, for our liberos to pass and serve receive and 2.2 uh, for anybody who's not a libero uh, in serve receive. We want a team uh, serve receive rating of, of about a 2.2. Uh, and it's tough, you know, especially, you know, you think that at the college level, your passer rating should be easier to attain uh, 2.2 or 2.4 uh, because you have better players. But um, the fact of the matter is you also have better servers on the other side who are serving, serving a lot tougher balls. So uh, it's tough. I think that that 2.2, 2.4 is still a really good goal for high school as well. Um, 
And so that's kind of what we would be looking for there. We would just have somebody rating our passers. Uh, you know, for us, uh, if our passers get aced, it's a zero. Um, if they pass the ball to where the, you know, you're, you're out of system and the setter or whoever takes second ball can only get it high into a pin, uh, they couldn't set any other hitter on the floor, then that's going to be a one. Um, if the pass is good enough to where you could set either pin, but maybe you couldn't get your middle involved, that's going to be a two. And then if you, you know, if the pass is perfect and you can set any hitter, then we, we call that a three. So that's how we get to, you know, the, the 2.2, 2.4. Um, if you pass the 2.4, you're, you're in system a whole lot of times, and that's going to make your offense a whole lot better. We flip cool. that on the, on the server rating. You know, if, if you ace the other side, then it's a four. Um, it's a four-point scale. Uh, if you kind of get them, yeah, flip it, flip it, yeah. So and what so, are you looking for off of that then? Uh, we're looking for around a three. You know, we, we can't get aces every time, but – and it depends. That That's a little bit more subjective because, um, you know, there, there are times where we're not necessarily looking for an ace. We're trying to take – a middle out, you know, so if our middle is, you know, entering from server C1 and she's going to run a slide there, well, then we might drop a short serve down in three uh, just to get in her pathway so that she's taken out and then you only have to worry about two hitters. So the likelihood of them passing a high ball inside the 10 foot line there is pretty good. You know, we're not we're not going at it real aggressively and short. We're just trying to get a high ball inside the 10 foot line to really mess up her pattern. And so that's going to mess with the server's rating. Um, and that's when you kind of have to come in with subjectivity and say, yeah, she didn't ace her, but she she did exactly what we wanted. So we might rate her as a, a three here instead of a two or whatever. Yeah, I think that's I think that's good because as I was talking to a couple of coaches about talking to you was, you know, I know you like stats. I know you have the ability to have that person that gives you in-game stuff. and But it's a lot of coaches, I think we understand the serve receive and how to, you know, four, three, two, all that stuff is, but it's what number, like like you already gave us, is what what would be a good number to go for? Like what is, you know, we're looking at serve receive efficiency. Well, what is efficient? Yeah. It, it, what really is a goal we we should shoot for? And like you said, I, especially at the high school level, I've been doing it since the days at Clinton. If I can get a two for the entire match, right, we're we're in ball games. I mean, yeah. we, we have a chance to win games and be competitive. Um, and I think what you said there is important. I think that that you need to start by just getting, where are you? You know, at the first of the year, where are we in serve receive? And then, you know, you can set that goal of 2.4 or 2.2 or whatever. But first I would see where I am and see, well, if I'm starting at a 1.2, you know, 1.5 is going to be pretty good. And once we get to 1.5, then let's get to 1.8, you know, and just gradually make your way up there. Yeah, we actually just had a scrimmage the other day for my club team, and I was trying to explain to them it was the first time ever fiddling with numbers. And, um, basically, we played a quick little set to 15, and we passed a point seven. Yeah. Right? We struggled. <laughs> um, but then I asked the girls, I said, why are we taking this? What was what the whole point of writing these numbers down and whatnot? And the very first thing they said was, well, to see if we've gotten better. So when we do it again, we can see if we got better. You know, eventually my first thought was, no, I want to see how good we're doing now. Yeah. But I, I, wow, that, that was a good good catch that I wasn't even focused on is that, okay, let's go see if we get better in this next set. You know, maybe that's a win for us. You know, and maybe that is for some coaches that, like you just said, maybe you're at the one, two. Well, maybe two, four, that's out of the – that's too far. You know, just work your way up. And, and we did. The next set we had – I don't even know, a 1.8 or something. And they all lost their minds like, because they understood there was growth. And they then, I think, saw the importance of it. And I think that's that's part of it right there. Um, so I I think these are good numbers. Um, it gives us ideas, coaches, of what should we shoot for? You know, uh, we've got the numbers. We're starting to take them. They understand it. What is the goal? Where do we set that? You know, and I love the goal. Uh, board you guys have I you still have that oh yeah oh yeah yeah and we we uh, constantly kind of tweak it and we we make it 
you know, this last year. So we have this big goal board in our locker room and, um, you know, we, we talk about, uh, we have those detailed stats that I talked about. So after the game, we can go back and look and see what our hitting percentage was, what our opponent's hitting percentage was. And I think right now we're trying to hit over 200 per match and we want to limit our opponents to 170 or less. Uh, don't quote me on all these. I'd have to look at our goal board, but, um, but then we look at things like, okay, did we have an unforced error in the last five points of any set? So then I'll go back through our detailed stats and see, okay, at 21, 22, um, you know, we had a service error that we we should have we should have been locked in right there. And we know in those last five points, you know, that's the time where we need to keep momentum on our side and go. Um, and we talk about what that means, how we serve differently and all, all of that stuff. But this year we added one that was in the face. Um, and so, you know, if our if our hitters were able to to hit anybody in the face, which we're not trying to hurt anybody, but, um, you know, that's something that, you know, we, we want to get up fast and we want to attack hard. Uh, we're going to put a little sticker on the board. So uh, we're constantly tweak it, tweaking it and uh, we're giving our players a chance to give some input on what should be on that goal board. And I think that that's made it really fun for us to evaluate post-match, you know, what happened in the match. And there's times where we go in and we say, look, we, we passed the 2.2. You know, we passed the 2.2. We hit 200. Uh, those things are really good, but we still took an L. What happened? And then we can look and see, well, they outblocked us or, um, you know, they were just really good. You know, that year that Washburn um, got beat in the Final Four, we came out and we took the first set off of them, played really competitively against them, played really well for us, uh, but they were just really good. And sometimes it's it's good to look at that and say, you know, I think we can get there. We just weren't there yet. We got to keep going. Yeah, it, there were several times throughout this past season that we we passed, I don't even, it was like a 1-3, one, 1-4. One, and it was one of our better hitting days. Like that, it's just weird to kind of see some of the, yeah. uh, how the stats start lining up is you would think, all right, you're passing better, you should hit better. But um, there were multiple games that we won when we passed worse, but all of a sudden we hit better. So you know, we were having a great out of system day or, yeah. you know, who knows what you, you have to do with that info. But, um, yeah, I think that's good stuff. Um, so kind of flip it into high school versus college here is what are you seeing from Oklahoma high schools as a college coach? I mean, are you what are you seeing in the landscape of high school volleyball here? I think that it's gaining traction, you know, and I, I think that um, – it's taken a while, you know, and, and for a while there were only a couple of club programs in the in the state that, you know, we would recruit from and, um, you know, high school, the high school season itself is shorter than all the other states around us. And, um, you know, it's just been different. But I was on the road a lot this year uh, just because our season got flipped with the COVID stuff. And so I was able to get out and it's growing. It's, it's getting a whole lot better. Um, there's some really good kids in the state. Uh, there's some really good coaches in the state. Um, and then just the fact that you and I are talking about volleyball, you know, on a random weekday when we're not, you know, at work, uh, I think that that says volumes about where we're going in the state. And more and more kids are playing, more and more kids are seeing that it's a, a awesome, fun sport. Um, and so I think that it's definitely growing in Oklahoma. Yeah, I, it's. I think, like you just said, it was. It's slowly getting there, and it, it's going to take some some things uh, to really get us to that point of being like the surrounding states. I mean, I, I think we can agree we are behind them, um, both club and, and uh, school ball. Um, what do you think would be able to help get us there? Maybe, like you said, the. Um, we have a shorter season compared to you think matching our season start and end dates with other states would be something we should look at. Yeah, I think that, you know, obviously the more you play, the better you get. And uh, I took Kate, uh, who played at Edmond Santa Fe, won a state championship there, uh, played for, you know, one of the biggest legends in, in high school volleyball in the state of Oklahoma. And uh, I took her to watch Emerald High play Randall High in, in, the, in the Texas Panhandle. And 
we walked in and of course those kids start, you know, I don't know, mid July and they're still playing when we go to our conference tournament in late November. So their season is so long. Um, but we walk in and I was just kind of curious to see what she thought about the difference in the level of play. And so we walk in and we're sitting there and she said, Oh yeah, these kids, these kids would probably, you know, compete against anybody in Oklahoma. And she, she was like, they're really good. And I said, well, this is a JV. And she was <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Yeah. yeah. And so then, you know, uh, when we, when we watch the varsity play, it's just, they would compete against us. Well, you know, they're, they're that good. And, um, so I think that the reason that they're there is because in Amarillo, they have a great club system. There's multiple clubs to choose from. They're always competing against each other. Uh, so they're playing really good club ball, but then they're playing high school ball for a long time. You know, and they're getting a lot of matches in, they're getting a lot of practices in, and they're just getting better and better all the time. And I think that that would grow the sport in Oklahoma if the season was a little bit longer, if the high school season was a little bit longer. Yeah, and I know something I've always tried to push for myself was scooting the start date to match school a little bit better for the fact that, you know, it's a school sport in that I think they should be getting to have that opportunity to play in front of their peers and have that environment. And, yeah. um, and I think also they need a, they need somewhat of a summer. I, I love the idea of a dead period that we've put in. Um, I think it needs to be maybe shifted a little bit, but I mean, it's just club ends for high level kids in what July, July, yeah. Six, seven, and then we start in the fifteenth. I mean, yeah. these kids don't have a downtime, and if we scooted it, they would have a little bit bigger gap there, um, where they could rest a little bit and and kind of just be a kid. You know, I, I think that's important for some of these these athletes. Um, yeah, I agree. But I think it's definitely gaining ground, and I mean, you know, the the main reason I started doing this was. We sit here and we're saying, what can we do? You know, and we come up with all these ideas and throw stuff around, but then it's like nothing, nobody ever does anything, you know? So I'm just going to do what I can do, which is let's talk about it. You know, let's, let's give some info about to athletes. Let's give some info to the parents. I, I think they're left out of the equation too often um, and give some to coaches. Like you said, there's some awesome coaches. We need more awesome coaches, you know, yeah. We need to have those middle school coaches building kids up and so that the ninth JV guys get them and, you know, they're at a different level and we can go even further. And, you know, it's just uh, it's a whole system we need to try to help. Um, so, I mean, I think, like you said, it, it speaks volume that we're just sitting here talking volleyball on, on our day off. Yeah. You know, just doing what we do. Um, just to have a little fun with it, if if you were like NFL draft, you got the first round draft pick, what position? You can't say six rotation outside because everyone says that. I don't what think position? I'd take a six rotation outside anyway. I think I'd take a setter. Why is that? Quarterback, I mean, she's, you know, you hope that she touches the ball every play. You know, your six rotation outside isn't going to touch the ball every play. Um, so, uh I think that most college programs uh, value it the same way. Um, you know, the Division II, very rarely do we give out full scholarships. Um, but my kids that I'm bringing in from high school, you know, I, I'm sorry, defensive specialist, but you're going to get the least amount of money because you're a dime a dozen. Because every kid who is an outside in high school who is uh, five foot six outside who could hit the ball kind of hard, but you know, can't put up a real good block. Well, she becomes a defensive specialist, you know, when she gets to the college level. Um, yeah. You know, your your middles are very valuable. Um, but again, they're a little bit easier to come by than a really, really good setter. And so, you know, there's kind of a hierarchy of where scholarship money goes. And I think that in most uh, universities that can't offer full rides, you're going to find that their setters get paid the most. And again, it's just because you want them to touch the ball every time. Uh, we give our setter 
full reign on the on the offense. You know, she's calling serve receive plays. Um, she has full reign to to go to a middle uh, in between plays and say, hey, you need to be available in transition and stop running the one every time. You gotta you gotta move around, go behind. Uh, you know, get a little bit further out in front of me. Um, she has full authority to do that. And so that takes a special person who can do that. A lot of people can do that, but they can't do it and still have the respect of that middle. Um, and so when we're when we're hunting for a setter, you know, it's a special thing. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, you know, setter has got to, A, go get to a ball, someone who has range to get their hands on a ball, and then also have range to spread it around. You know, right. and, and give you options, um, and you can kind of that position can help you if you've got bad passers if they can get there. You know, that kind of makes up for it in a way. And if you oh, yeah. have, you know, hitters that don't have a big window to uh, adjust, you know, if they can put it there pretty good, then we don't have to worry about those problems. And they kind of help alleviate those. And so. I, I just think it's always an interesting because you got people that say six rotation outside, I think just right off their head. Some people say libero because, you know, you got to have somebody that gets this out of the ball. Yeah. You know, if we can't, ball, we're just out here shagging. And, yeah. You know, so uh, speaking of libero, there, there's always this this talk about do you put them in left back or do you put them in middle back? And I, I don't think either is the right answer. I think it's why you're putting them there. Um, and what that has to do with maybe your system or your your, your lack of ability sometimes. You know? yeah. So what's your take on liberos being left or middle back? We have always played our libero and left back, um, but we have ran the analytics and, and taken a look at, you know, where we need to have people. We've also been very lucky in the fact that we've had outsides and defensive specialists who can play middle back really well. Um, but, you know, there's a school of thought out there that uh, it should be in the middle back. Uh, and they even play on middle middle. A lot of people will play on middle middle. So they'll play them right in the middle of the floor because, uh, you know, there's statistics that say that's where the most uh, balls hit the ground. Uh, I think that a lot of those statistics were ran at Division One universities where you have girls touching, you know, 10, 4, 10, 5, you know, hitting the ball extremely hard. At our level, um, you know, just from us going back and doing the analytics on it, a lot of the, the balls that hit are on the back line. And so what we try to do is we try to take, um, you know, away uh, the strongest attack first, and that's usually going to be your outside hitter. They're going to get the most attempts. Uh, hopefully we're keeping the other side out of system, and so they're getting a lot of out of system uh, sets out to the outside. And so we will block line on the outside and take away her line and make the ball travel as far as possible before the first person touches it. So that would obviously be cross court to the libero and left back. Um, and then, you know, that we will, we will have to deal with the outside attack more than any other attack. So now if we were going to play a team and, and we really felt like, you know, they were going to attack the middle of the floor, I would not have a problem with moving her to the middle of the floor. And there have been times where um, I think a couple of years back, we had Lindsay McCauley, and Lindsay was a fantastic middle back. I mean, she just had a knack for it. Um, she understood exactly her role and what balls she was supposed to take. And she was quick and she had great reaction time. She did a lot of really good things. And if we didn't have Caitlin Dillon at libero, um, we, we probably would have put uh, Lindsay at libero middle back and ran an outside in, in left back or uh, put, you know, a defensive specialist in left, in left back. But Kate was so good at libero that, you know, we needed to leave her at libero at left back. And Lindsay still got a lot of digs. And uh, when we won a conference championship in 15, Lindsay was flying all over the place and getting a ton of digs in middle back. So um, I don't think that there is – I'm not one of those guys who's like, it's my way or the highway and this is the only way we're going to do it and blah, 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 blah. You got to do what's best for you and do what's best for your program. Yeah, I – you know, I'd read the stats too, and you know, I really like the idea that you know, if you're putting up a block, then most balls go cross court. We'll put your best passer there because they're getting the most balls. And I tried that, and the same libero I had this year, her junior year, only had like 300 digs, but I put her in middle back this year, and all of a sudden now she's got close to 550, 600 digs. Yeah, I think that had to do with our system, but it also had to do with 
mobility. She was great uh, side to side. You know, she really could cover corners well for us and read and kind of be able to sit back and and just survey all what was going on. So um, I think it does really depend on what each kid's strength is. Um, I think it also helped our middle back that we we didn't block well enough. Just honestly, we didn't. We left a lot of gaps, and so they were taking taking it. I mean, we we had someone who wasn't there, so they really were taking cross, and and so middle back started to get a lot of balls. And and uh, you know, I I want to be careful how I say this because I understand that there are several programs in the state who are going to hit the ball hard almost every play. Um, and you know, that's what we're going to see. Most games that we play in, it's going to be a swing. You know a lot of time and when it is a tip or a roll or an off speed it was chosen that way and it was because they saw an opening where a lot of the games that i saw at the high school level this year um you know whether it be a lack of setter uh, which was something that we just talked about or just a, a lack of um training there were more tips more rolls more off speed shots than there are hard driven balls so that's automatically going to lend itself to the middle of the court um, and yeah, 100%, uh, that's a great idea to put your libero in the middle of the court so she can go and get tips and rolls and dinks and all of those things. So I like that. Yeah. And like I said, I think I had to kind of take myself back and say, well, I thought this was going to work, but what's really working for us because our blocking isn't there is to slide that, that libero to middle and she can help us where we're hurting. Right. Yes, we should close the block, but the reality is we aren't right now. And yeah. so here's what we're going to do to fix that, you know? Right. Um, so you kind of touched on club a little bit ago, but how do you think club volleyball factors in for college coaches in regards to like recruiting? Well, in a normal year, it, it it's a big factor. It really is. Um, you know, that's where a lot of coaches get out and evaluate, uh, especially coaches in more metropolitan areas in Weatherford, they're coaching club. And so they're going to take their club team to a tournament and they're, they're going to watch every other club team. And so they're going to select from what they see in club. A lot of times, uh, you know, we recruit a little bit differently out here just because of where we're located and some of the other job duties that I have at Swasu. Um, but yeah, the club thing is, it's very important. Yeah, I, I don't think, think it's a do or die thing. I think there's been a lot of kids who, you know, played basketball or, you know, ran track in the spring and didn't have time and, and still made it to the college level to play volleyball. Yeah. And, it, you know, actually, I like that you brought that up because we had talked about me and a handful of coaches of do they have to play club or, you know, multi-sport athletes. And, and you know, the stats show that actually multi-sport athletes are way less likely to get hurt. They're you know, don't get have the burnout factor as much. And so, you know, it's kind of interesting, but at the same time, it's hard to say club doesn't really help kids because it helps their skills. It, it helps. Does, yeah. eat, you know? So it's kind of a catch 22 in a way. So, um, a couple more is, um, what is a drill that you, you would think would be very helpful to maybe put in the toolbox for a high school coach? Uh, one of the drills that, and, and it's tough because it depends on how much space you have and how many kids you have. Uh, but one thing that we really moved to, we just talked about how serving pass is so important, but we do serve receive ladders. Um, and, uh, we do those a lot. You really have to get your kids to compete at it. Um, they have to understand cause it can be a monotonous drill. Uh, it, once you get your kids to compete and they realize that they're moving up and down in the, the leaderboard. You know, we always have a whiteboard in our gym, so we we have that leaderboard where they can see it. Um, they get to go over and, and mark, you know, how many points they score. But basically, you're just going to group those kids up, um, usually in groups of two. And so if you numbered off those groups, one, two, three, and four, and one and two are a team, and, and three and four are a team, um, then uh, one and two will be on one side of the net serving at three and four. Uh, let's say that they start in left back. Uh, they're going to receive uh, however many serves you give them. Uh, we typically do five. So they'll receive five serves from the other side. Um, and they're grading themselves just like we grade serve receive. So sometimes we'll put setters out there setting those passes. 
Um, sometimes we'll put a basket out there and, you know, we'll say, okay, if you get it in the basket, it's three points. If you hit the basket, it's two points. If, you know, you're, if you hit the floor, but it's still a ball that could have been gotten to, it's one, blah, blah, blah. Um, so they're grading themselves. They're keeping up with their own points while that other side is serving. After five, uh, they stay on the, the, in left back, but they switch. Um, so the, the passer that was in the middle of the floor will now be on the sideline. The passer that was on the sideline will now be in the middle of the floor. Servers keep serving. They serve five more. Um, then uh, they go and write their scores down. Servers, for any service errors, they are minus points. Okay. Um, the passers, are they've been grading themselves that whole time. They're going to go write down their total number. Then they're going to flip. So now the passers become servers. And the servers become passers. And then you just grade it out. And so a lot of times we'll put our DSs competing against DSs. We'll put our uh, pins competing against pins. And then usually we'll have coaches serving at middles or middle serving at middle short where we would have them in serve receive. Um, but you can have both sides of the court going at the same time. So you can have a group passing and left uh, left back. Uh, twos. You can have a different group passing and right back twos. And, you know, same on the other side. So you have um, eight players there serving and passing e at each other. And then you add in middles. So you can have four more middles serving and passing too. So you can almost um, accompany your entire team in that drill. Yeah. Can you, can you see me now that that just went off? Yeah, I can see you. Oh, there we go. Everything's back to normal. <laughs> so maybe just people that are visual learners, you're saying that you have – two groups because you've split them into four and one and two maybe right. and three and four right. over here sitting at them. And then you're Correct. just great. They get so many serves, five, 10, whatever. And then they switch. Two goes where one is, one goes where two is. Continue that trend. Come write your numbers down. And then three and four flip sides and go over there. And so now everyone has become – um well, serve receive for twice and serving twice. And then based off those numbers, you can see who is doing the best at serving or best at serve receive. And, and right. that's where you get that ladder or hierarchy kind of. And out of, out of one, two, three, and four, we'll do several, we'll do enough rounds that one will be with two, but then one will also be with three for a round. One will also be with four for a round. So they've all played together and now they all have different scores. Right. Because what one scored with two, she's going to score differently with four. So then after that first time you do it, let's say that one scored 40 points. Now I'm just making up points. But one scored 40 points and she's in first place. And four scored 39. She's in second place. And three scored 28. She's in third place. And two just had a really bad day and she scored 20. Well, she's in fourth place. Well, you put that up on the board next time and that's how you group them based off of that. So – in the first round, your your top score will go with your bottom score. Then those next two will go together. And so then they're trying to move up and down the ladder mm -hmm. you know, on that day. People who use a competitive cauldron um, who actually decide who is going to play for them, who's going to be in the starting lineup based on drills. They keep scoring everything. You know, those ladders would be big. You know, uh, Kaylee Mater, who played for us and then uh, was one of my first assistants, she uses a competitive cauldron to decide who her who her libero is. It's basically her her ladders decide who her libero is. Yeah, I think that's a interesting thing. I think there's pros and cons of that, just like there is anything. Yeah, but yeah, I agree. I think it's an awesome way to get kids to compete. I think it's a it's an awesome drill to implement um, to not just be a monotonous serve serve receive. Hey, we're going to serve for five minutes, and then we're going to you know. It's a way to put points on. It's a way to make competitive um and, and for, for yeah. us for for those four kids to to go through the whole thing with each other it usually takes about 20 minutes um our setters are setting the entire time we usually have a setter on each side they're setting that whole time our middles are getting lots of reps everybody is being utilized in that drill except coaches you know it runs itself so now as coaches you know me and my assistants can walk around and we can really fine tune on some passing things and really be like, you know, I'm going to watch every rep that you take right here to make sure that, you know, your, your platform is straight and simple or whatever your terminology is. 
um, it really gives us a chance to to coach instead of managing the drill. Because a lot of times, you know, as a coach, you, you spend more time managing the drill, populating the right line, getting people where they're supposed to be instead of actually coaching, you know, the technique that's going on. And in ladders, this is 20 minutes where they're going to get tons and tons of serving reps and passing reps, which we've already said are the two most important things in, uh, in volleyball. Um, and you're opened up to where you're not managing the drill, you're managing your players and really coaching technique. Yeah, I think that's, uh, especially for high school, I mean, this could be a great thing to, like I said, make it competitive, but it's not necessarily um, you versus the drill. It could be you versus the other people in the gym. and mm -hmm. um, You get to be on both sides of, I can increase my score or I can decrease their score. Um, so I think it's, that's awesome, you know. Um, so one last couple things is, is what would be a nugget or two of advice that you would give for parents that are watching of volleyball players and, and you know, just people that are um, – don't understand the game quite like coaches and players do? Uh, I would say dive into it. You know, all the resources that I've used to, to learn about volleyball since I started in 05 – uh, when I was really behind the eight ball, you know, I, I didn't have very much of a base and I was starting at the college level. Um, you know, all of those are available to everyone. You know, a parent can get on and learn those things on YouTube just like you and I do. Uh, so learn, uh, get with your kids and ask questions, make them explain it to you because when your your kids are telling you what's going on on the volleyball court, they're gaining a deeper understanding at the same time. Uh, and so communicate with them and learn from them and then, I would treat it just like I would with the, uh, you know, the baseball coach that's helping out or whatever. If you don't fully understand the game, that's fine. Encourage, uh, love on your kids, tell them they're doing a great job. If it's an effort thing, you don't have to have, you know, you don't have to have a PhD in volleyball. Tell them, hey, your effort sucks. I don't know if you're supposed to be doing this or that. I don't know what rotation is, but I can just tell that you're not playing hard and you need to get better there. Um, sometimes kids need to hear that from parents. I know I needed to hear that from my parents, you know? Um, so, uh, those are the things that I would say. Um, and then I get a lot of questions about recruiting, you know, how, how do I get, you know, my daughter seen, how do I, you know, how do she wants to play college ball? What level should she play at? Where should she go? Um, and you know, I, I would say, get out. I tell every kid, you know, we had some really big time recruits on campus this year, kids who had, uh, lots of Division One opportunities, uh, kids who were recruited by a lot of really good D2s. Um, and when we sat down in my office before I made them that offer, I told them, I want you to go. You know, we want you here. We're going to offer you a scholarship, but I want you to go and see, go and look, show up on campuses, knock on doors, send a thousand emails, make phone calls, make a list of your top uh, schools that you would like to play at, and then get in front of them. Um, and then see everything that way you know and i tell our kids if you decide to come here and play for swasu i want you to bleed bulldog blue i want you to know that you saw everything else out there because there are going to be tough days and two a days there are going to be tough losses there are going to be times where you're on the bench where you don't think you should be and if you don't bleed blue at that point then you're going to be thinking about oh what if i would have visited this other place or what if i would have went to this other place so go go to camps uh sign up for camps go see how the coaching staff works ask the coaches about their values, you know, all of those things. And all the time I get, well, I sent you three or four emails. Well, I, I get like 110 emails a day from recruits. Um, I can't get to all of those. I just can't. There may be 10, you know, all Americans waiting in my mailbox who just want to be bulldogs, but I just can't get to all of them. It's the kids who show up on my campus. It's the kids who, um, you know, find a way to stand out to me who have contacts uh, they get to me and say, hey, this kid is really good. You need to take a look at her. Those are the kids that get seen by us, not the kid who sends a bulk email to a thousand people. Um, you know, it's the kids who make it spe uh, specialized to the program that they want to go to. Yeah. I, uh, I want to get your take because it's, I think it's really starting to um, thing. Having these showcases where they – go and they get all those stats kind of um you know they're vertical and this and that and then they'll do some drills with some high level people mm -hmm. as a college coach 
would you recommend that to those kids? Or, I mean, do you find it extremely useful? I think it depends on, it depends on the, um, the group that's putting it together. You know, if it's highly organized and they have great contacts and they're talking to the right people, seeing a vertical is always nice. It really is. You know, um, we got a kid on our team right now who touches around 10 foot and knowing that she touched that high, you know, we felt really comfortable bringing her in at the posi position that we brought her in at and she's excelled since she's been here. Um, and that was verified by one of those, you know, combines or whatever you want to call it, showcases. Um, and so as a college coach, when I see it's verified by, you know, those things, I know that she really touched it. It wasn't just her high school coach or, you know, her one of her parents, usually her dad out there with some makeshift tape on the wall saying that she touches 10-7, you know. <laughs> right. But she's not getting recruited by any D1. She touches 10-7, but not getting recruited by D1s. So then I'm going to kind of be like, eh, I don't know about that, you know. So right. when it's verified, that does help. Um, you know, for me, I want to see about two minutes of film. Usually if it's an attacker, I can see one attack and see, okay, you've got what it takes or you don't. You know, it, you just see it enough that it, it doesn't take a whole lot. And so if you can put together a YouTube, you know, clip, great. Um, a lot of people use NCSA or, uh, you know, there's several different platforms out there, sports recruits. I mean, all these different recruit recruiting platforms, um, they cost money, but they do a lot of the work for you too. They're emailing the coaches. They have, you know, a, a platform online that is very accessible to me. I can get on there. I can type out exactly what I'm looking for. So we'll use those programs quite a bit, but if you can just put it on YouTube and, and make sure it gets in the hands of the coaches that, uh, you know, your daughter, wants to play for well then uh, that's just as good as any recruiting service right yeah i think that's good for, for parents and athletes to know and i know these showcases have really started to, uh, to gain some traction i'm starting to see more of them throughout the year kind of pop up and, and become a thing now. and yeah uh, you know i have parents all the time it's like mm, is this worth it is this you know some scam thing and i'm like uh, you know yeah. I, there's like an abundance of places for volleyball parents to spend money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, one last thing is, you know, you all, you guys always have these mottos. Um, man, where do you get these mottos? And and do you let your team pick? Do you just pull a name out of a hat and say, this one's – like, how does that all go down? A lot of times somebody on our team will come up with it. Um, you know, we're, we're going on our third year. We're going through a book. Uh, called Energy Bus by John Gordon. Yep. And uh, every year I'm like, do we want to try a new book? And they're like, no, we like Energy Bus. Uh, and it seems like you get something out of it. I've been through it probably seven or eight times now, and I, I've gotten something out of it every time. Um, but, you know, we really adapted that. We have language from it. You know, there's things that we say specifically in the gym, like, hey, you're being an energy vampire, or let's make our have to or get to. Um, you know, we really developed a language from the book. And so our hashtag for all of our pictures online, our T-shirts have it on there a lot uh, for the last couple of years has been uh, hashtag buckle up, you know, like you're getting on the bus and you're going to stay on the bus. So um, that's been a kind of our rises one in the most recent years. But we've had rises one heart, uh, heart over hype. Um, you know, I can't remember all the other ones that we have, but no, I'm not the creative genius behind that. I usually let my players come up with that. Yeah, I think that's good. It, man, I hope my kids watch this because Energy Bus is one of them that uh, I've been given to a player every so often and have them read it and give it to someone they think, you know, it would benefit them to have. And, and you know, just going through those things where um, mental training, you know, I think that's an overlooked aspect of, our sport for sure, but every sport really. I mean, you never hear. I tell, about I tell our kids all the time, all the time. It's I'm I'm guessing it's the same at the uh, at the high school level. Now it was different when I coach guys. Um, when you coach guys, usually the drama that uh, occurs is because somebody's self esteem is too high. You know, guys are typically arrogant and think that their way is the right way. Uh, but the great thing about guys, you just put them in a room, they take shots at each other, and then they're going to lunch together the next day. 
what I found coaching girls is that the problems that typically happen are because of a lack of self-esteem. And um, usually the person that's receiving the, you know, the lashing out or whatever may be happening can't empathize. They can't see, okay, she is self-conscious about this and didn't like this. And this is why she's acting that way. And so we talk about that all the time and energy bus, man, it, it just fixes all those problems, you know, because then you start loving that person, understanding that, you know, maybe they're just, you know, a, they have something about, you know, whatever is going on that they're self-conscious about and their self-esteem is a little bit down. And so they're going to react this way instead of reacting the way that you want them to react. And I don't know. I just really like that book and and it's been great for us. No. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, and it, I loved it. And I immediately started handing it out to my players and, and, you know, give it, give it to them, have them read it, have them talk to me about it. You know, what did you understand from it? What did you, you know, what, you know, just all those things and have them, have a better understanding of, like you said, how much energy and culture you've already talked about is important and empathizing with people and um, picking each other up, you know, being there for them and, you know, kind of saying, hey, jump on the bus here real quick and, you know, yeah. let me get you pep. Let me be the driver, you know, yeah. like, you know, uh, so that's awesome. But, well, that's all I got for you. And, you know, we all appreciate it. I appreciate it. I know you, um, always there to help me out with, with some things. And I hope this has helped some other people out. And, um, you know, you're an awesome coach. You're an awesome person. Um, you know, I just wish you guys the best and I appreciate you jumping on here with us. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you putting this together and feel the same way about you. And if I can be of help to you or anybody who's watching this, please feel free to reach out. All right. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, man.